today I want to go over some principles about how to build viruses. And I call this structure of viruses. And so far in this course, I have shown you lots of diagrams of viruses and some pictures. Today, I want to show you how to build these viruses and what good it is to do that. And I actually have some viruses with me today, which are obviously bigger than real life. And we can talk about these, but I'll put them up here so you can stare at them. They're both poliovirus. This one here has eyes to make it appealing to kids. All right, so viral proteins. The proteins that make up virus particles have very specific functions. I want you to think about them in these terms. They have functions to protect the genome, obviously. So they have to make a shell so that it will protect the genome going from cell to cell and host to host. And all the viruses we know of do that. Now, remember I told you about viroids in the beginning. These are little naked RNA molecules that go from plant to plant and they don't encode any proteins, so we don't consider those viruses. But it goes to show that you could be just an RNA, but all the other viruses that infect everything else have a protein shell to protect the genome. So the proteins that make up the virus, no matter what they look like, they have to protect the, shell, the genome. They also have to be able to recognize specifically the nucleic acid of the virus. You do not want to put inside the particle cellular nucleic acid. It would do no good whatsoever for the virus. So there has to be a specific way of getting the viral genome into this protective shell. By the way, we call this packaging, okay, packaging of the genome into the particle. That means specifically getting the, vir the genome inside of this protective shell. Uh, and then some viruses have envelopes or membranes. So in the middle is a virus that looks like polio. This is just a protein shell. But some viruses have envelopes around them and they're drawn in a, in a way that indicates that. And so the viral proteins have to have a way to interact with the membrane and make an envelope. And that's a process we'll talk about later. So that's for protecting the genome. The proteins also have to deliver the genome. So it's a very interesting paradox. These particles have to be very stable, yet they have to deliver the genome at some point. That is what we call metastability. We'll talk about that today. So these particles have to be constructed in a way so that at some signal they deliver the genome into the cell. So they bind to host cell receptors. The genome is released and that we call that uncoding. So the release of the genome from the particle is called uncoding. In some cases, when there's a membrane on the particle, the membrane has to fuse with the membrane of the cell. And finally, sometimes the proteins, the structural proteins, make sure that the genome goes to the right place in the cell. Depending on the virus and the kind of genome it has, DNA or RNA, sometimes the cytoplasm is the destination and sometimes it's the nucleus. And the viral proteins associated with the particle help make that decision. A lot of these processes we will talk about next time when we talk about entry and encoding, but again, they're important processes contributed by the structural proteins. Now, before we go any further, let's make some definitions to make sure you understand the terms that I use. First is what I call a subunit. When I talk about a subunit of a virus particle, what I mean is, the single, is a single folded polypeptide chain. And here on the right is a poliovirus, and here are the individual polypeptide chains, VP1, VP2, VP3. These are single polypeptides, so that's what I mean by a subunit. Then we have a structural unit, and that's the unit from which the capsids or the nucleocapsids are built. So here on the upper right is a capsid. It's the same thing that's sitting down here on the desk. These are capsids. Same idea as up on, on that picture. And the structural unit is made up of one or more subunits. So sometimes in the very simple virus, the structural unit can be the same as a subunit, one protein, one subunit. But sometimes the structural unit is multiple subunits or multiple polypeptides. So here 
The structural unit in this poliovirus is outlined in blue. You can see it has a blue, a yellow, and a red polypeptide. And then we have capsid, which is the shell surrounding the genome. It comes from a Latin word meaning box. So that's a capsid on the upper right. These are capsids sitting down here on the desk. These, the capsid is the protein shell which surrounds the genome. By the way, there is a genome in here, you know. It is 7,442 bases long, and it was, it was beaded by a, a virologist for me. She beaded it in the right sequence. It has four different beads in four different colors. And next time I'll, I'll talk about how this gets out of the particle, because I can't get it out, it's so tangled. And, they are, and this is the same problem that the RNA genome has. Anyway, that's a capsid, and this is one too that's just fuzzy, okay? Uh, capsid, then we have nucleocapsid. This is a term that confuses half the class every year. And I predict it will be the same this year, unless I try a little better to explain it. The definition is the nucleic acid protein assembly within the particle. But it only applies when, there's, when it's a discrete substructure, okay? So it's nucleic acid with proteins on it. And if you look at this influenza virus on the right, the influenza virus has a membrane around it. That's the, um, the light brown structure. And then in the membrane, there, there are spikes or glycoproteins, which we'll talk about later. And then in the middle, there's the RNA genome. It's eight pieces of RNA wrapped in protein. That's the nucleocapsid because it's a substructure. But if it was just the RNA proteins, it wouldn't be a nucleocapsid because it's not a substructure. Polio is not a nucleocapsid because the RNA is, is naked inside of it. If it had an envelope around it, then this structure on the upper right would be a nucleocapsid. Anyway, I'll give you more examples as we go through this. Then we have envelope, which is just the viral membrane. I'll use both terms interchangeably. Always derived from the host cell. Membranes of viruses always come from host cells. And then the virion, which I've used a lot already and not defined it, but it's the infectious virus particle. So I will use virus particle to mean just that, but that could mean non-infectious or infectious. But when I say virion, I specifically mean um, infectious virus particles. Now let's do a little bit of scale here to put things in perspective. Um, I'll use nanometer terms or angstrom terms or micron terms, and that's what they mean. A nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters, which is the same as 10 angstroms or 0.001 microns. I tend to use angstroms mostly, but you'll see all of these. And here are some measurements to put things in perspective. The alpha helix in a protein, here is a protein over on the right, is one nanometer in diameter, just the helix itself. DNA is two nanometers in diameter, so this double helix structure here with the black background, that is two nanometers in diameter. This ribosome, is 20 nanometers in diameter. Polio is just slightly bigger, 30 nanometers. And uh, this huge Pandora virus is 1,000 nanometers. And the biggest viruses we've talked about so far would be 1,500 nanometers or 1 1.5 microns. So that gives you a sense of what the numbers mean in, in terms of the virus particles. So everything is really small. So back to metastability. Virus particles are met metastable because they have to be stable to protect the particle as it floats in the air, as it sits on a desk, as it passes through your GI tract with all the insults. Yet, it has to come apart at some point to release the genome because with just a few exceptions, and you'll see them uh, today and next time, the genome needs to get out of the particle in order to start replicating in the cell. So that's what I mean by metastability. So here we have a virus particle binding to a cell surface and undergoing a change which is depicted here by a different color. And that change is needed for the RNA to get out, which is shown here in the last step. So uncoding again, the RNA, in this case it's an RNA virus, the RNA is getting out of the particle. So the purple virion is very stable. And only when it binds the receptor does it let go of the RNA. That's one trigger for inducing this change that lets the genome out, binding receptors. But there are others, and we will talk about those next time. Another way to look at metastability is that virus particles have not attained the minimum free energy confirmation. 
And to do that, they have to mount an unfavorable energy barrier. So here's a, a kind of a schematic of that, is a graph of energy versus uh, position of the virus particle at, on an en energy graph, if you will. So it, viruses, number one, exist in this region where they're very stable, and they have to get to this region, number three, where they're unstable and allow to, to release the genome. And they have to surmount an energy barrier to do that, and that's where a receptor can play in. A receptor can help the virus get over that energy barrier by helping to take it apart. Be, there can be other triggers as well. Now, the energy needed for that to surmount this barrier here, for the particle to go over the barrier and get to this minimum free energy conformation where it can come apart, that energy is built into the particle during assembly. And we call that spring loading to give it a nice uh, conceptual uh, thought to it. So we assemble the particle and in the bonds that are formed during assembly is energy that are then released uh, during this process of entry so that the genome can go out so the virus can reach that minimum free energy conformation. So there's potential energy built into the particle. It's used for disassembly. And again, the cell has to provide a signal. The virus doesn't supply the signal on its own because viruses are floating around in the air and, and body fluids and so forth. And the only, you have to time it. You, the virus will release the genome only upon the uh, encountering of a signal from the right host cell. And it has to be the right cell on top of it. So how do you make a metastable particle, something that's really stable under some conditions that will come apart? Uh, well, you start with a very stable particle, and as you'll see today, one way to do that is by this symmetrical arrangement of identical proteins, so you get maximal contact between the proteins, and that gives you a very stable structure. Lots of viruses are built that way. These two capsids on the desk here are built with that kind of symmetry. But not all viruses are. Some viruses have what we see as absolutely no symmetry whatsoever. So there are obviously other ways to do that, and we haven't figured out the, um, the mechanisms in those cases. Uh, and so that's the stable structure, making it symmetrical and high contact among the proteins. And how do you make it unstable? The interactions among proteins in a virus particle typically are not covalent. Again, there are a few exceptions, but the vast majority, they're non-covalent, so they're not bonded together, and that allows you the potential to take it apart uh, during infection to the release the genome. And so the triggers that do that are some of the th things we'll, we'll talk about next time when we look at um, entry and encoding. So this first question is virus, viral capsids are metastable because A, they must protect the viral genome outside of the cell. B, they must come apart and release the genome in a cell. C, they have not obtained a minimum free energy confirmation. D, they are spring-loaded. E, all of the above. All right, the answer is all of the above. All these things are right. A few of you answered they must come apart and release the genome. That's part of it. That's correct on its own, but everything else is correct also. We're going to look at structures of viruses today. And I want to tell you first how we get those structures, because it's quite interesting. And there are a number of tools, some of which are here. There, there are more that have been developed recently. They include electron microscopy, x-ray crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy, and cryo-electron tomography, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. If you have the book and you'd like to learn more about those, there's more detail in chapter four. This, I visited Cornell up in Ithaca uh, two years ago, and this is a cryo-EM microscope, and this is the tech who I know as Cryo Marina on Instagram. She puts pictures of viruses there, and that's, that's her little phage there. And uh, this thing is amazing. These are million-dollar instruments. Look at all the wires here in the back. Is this taken from the back of it here? I mean, you, you have to have advanced knowledge in engineering to run one of these things. And here we are, we're generating biological data with them, but they're really complicated because they take high energy, high voltage and pass it through the specimen to get the imaging. Now, the electron microscope was developed uh, in the 30s in Germany, actually. And if you go to the Technological Museum in Munich, they have one of the original ones there. And then in 1940, Helmut Ruska used it to look at viruses for the first time. He took this picture of uh, bacteriophages, which you can find on the web, uh, and those are 
bacteriophage particles attached to a, a, probably an E. coli. And this is the paper published in 1940 in German. And from that point on, we began to learn a lot about the structure of viruses. Now, in order to look at viruses with a conventional electron microscope, it's passing electrons through a specimen. So electrons give you a very high resolution, which is not possible with light, right, which has a, higher, a longer wavelength. The problem is there's no contrast in biological specimens. So you have to stain them in some way. And for electron micrographs, what is done is called negative staining with an electron-dense material. That is, some material that will reflect electrons and not let it pass it through the specimen. It needs include uranyl acetate, phosphotungstate, highly toxic <laughs> stains that you have to stain your specimens with. They scatter electrons. That was developed in 1959. And here are some photographs taken by conventional EM with a negative staining technique. So what you see is what is in white is stained and it's reflecting the electrons. The black is when the electrons pass through and they expose either the film or that nowadays a, a digital detector. So here you can see this adenovirus particle where obviously most of the caps it has been stained and you can see little dark circles around the subunits and that's where the electrons have passed through so there's no staining there, there must be space. The fibers are stained as well and the rest is all dark because the electrons have passed through. So that's why we call it negative staining. It's, it's basically producing a negative of the image. Here's some hepatitis B virus particles, an influenza virus particle. And here, here are um, some polio viruses. You can see they have a roughly spherical shape and some of them look empty, right? And that's because they're broken and that's part of the reason why the particle to PFU ratio is high because you have a lot of broken particles. Now, the resolution of EM is not high. It's about seven, 50 to 75 angstroms. So, you know, if, if you consider that an alpha helix of a protein is 10 angstroms, you cannot see alpha helices with negative stain EM. So you only get this overview of what a virus particle looks like, which is important because for the, it showed us for the first time that they were actually particles, and they're different, and they have interesting shapes. But you cannot get detailed structure. And so we needed to develop other means to do that. Um, so here, this was developed in 1950, but X-ray crystallography, of course, uh, was developed not long after that. And, and that's, a that's a technique where you, you make a crystal of what you want to determine a high resolution structure from. So here you can grow poliovirus crystals, grow lots and lots of virus and figure out what makes them form a nice crystal. And then you bombard it with X-rays and the x-rays will hit all the atoms in the virus and they will scatter and you can capture the scattering called the diffraction pattern. These, this is famous because of Watson and Crick holding up their, their, their diffraction pattern of DNA in the 50s, which is probably Rosalind Franklin's x-ray of the DNA diffraction pattern. But from where each spot is, it's a, it's a reflection of the original atoms in the specimen and you can use methods to figure out the structure. And if you have the protein sequence, it really helps you. Now, these were, x-ray structures were first done with small proteins like myoglobin and hemoglobin, but it was impossible to do viruses which are much bigger and more complicated. We didn't have the computational power. And only until computers came along and the al algorithms developed could we then solve the structures of viruses by x-ray crystallography. You get fabulous resolution, two to three angstroms, so you can see not just the backbone of the protein, but the side chains as well. So that's x-ray crystallography. Then what was developed was a um, technique called cryo-electron microscopy, or cryo-EM. And last year, the Nobel Prize for developing this technique went to three recipients, including Joachim Frank of Columbia University at the Medical Center. Uh, and this reflects that these three individuals made different contributions to developing cryo-EM to solve structures of big things, not just viruses, but ribosomes and so forth. Now, how does this work? So you don't have to make a crystal, and that's one of the reasons that drove the development of cryo-EM, because making a crystal is iffy. It's black magic. You could spend years just making crystals of your virus, only to find out that they didn't diffract properly. So, it's not a great technique. What you do here is you freeze your viruses in vitreous ice, and that's all you have to do. And that's a picture of these frozen particles. The freezing itself, and one of these gentlemen figured out exactly what to freeze them in to give the best contrast. 
it gives enough contrast so that you can see the particle and you can take pictures of it. And what you do is you take hundreds and hundreds of pictures of the particles. And the idea is that each particle sitting on the grid in the ice is in a slightly different rotational state, right? They're all different rotations. And you use basically that information with algorithms to piece together a three-dimensional view of the particle or the protein, whatever it is that you want to do. You could think of it as a CAT scan where you slide into a, or an MRI, you slide into a big magnet and a camera goes around you and takes x-rays as it circles you. And then those are all assembled into three-dimensional uh, representation. It's the same thing here, except the particles are sitting on the grid. Now in a new inc incarnation of this, it's called cryo-EM tomography, you actually tilt the stage so that you don't have to look at as many particles and you can use the tilting and getting images at different angles to extrapolate the structure. So what you do here is you, you take individual particles, you do a Fourier transform of the data, uh, and then you mix them together and reverse the Fourier to get the particle reconstruction. And so that has been used now more and more. And initially it had very low resolution, like 20 to 30 angstroms, but just by modifying the algorithms, more computational power and better detectors, better EM machines that cost more, we can get that down to two angstroms. We can rival crystallization in the resolution here. It's really remarkable. It can be done much faster because you don't have to make crystals. So here are two examples. On the upper left, poliovirus, the x-ray structure was solved in 1985. It was one of the first animal viruses uh, a plant virus had been solved a, f a number of years before. That's poliovirus, 2.9 angstroms resolution. You can see all the alpha carbons and all the side chains. Every atom is displayed in this structure. And on the right is the cryo-EM structure of polio, 20 angstroms. And you can see you get much less information. You just get an approximation of the surface, which in itself can be useful, um, but it's not great. And these, these two viruses on the front are both poliovirus. We'll talk a little bit about more, but you can see this is a spherical virus built with symmetry of some sort. We will talk about that. Um, and this one, this, this, by the way, this plastic model comes from the 70s before we had any virus structures. And a company sold these subunits that you could buy and piece them together. Um, this, is, this fluffy thing is made by giant microbes, of course. It's polio. And um, as you will see, it's quasi-accurate. This is uh, the structure of Zika virus. Now, Zika virus emerged not too many years ago. And within six months, the structure was solved by cryo-EM at 3.8 angstroms. Now, when you have these data, when you have X-ray or cryo-EM data, what you have is a file with the X, Y, Z coordinate of every atom in the particle. And there are programs now that you can use, uh, and I use them to build these images where you can make different representations of the virus particles. So here, uh, this is a ribbon representation of the, just the backbone of the polypeptide, no side chains. Um, and that sometimes has some uses. So you see, I, I, I've on the top here added some side chains because these are sugar moieties that are thought to be important for attachment to cells. And on the upper left is a space filling version where you make all the atom spheres and you get a better sense of the three-dimensionality of the particle. But again, all of this is possible from the coordinates and very powerful computing. This is the biggest virus whose structure has been solved. It's called Cafeteria Rowanbergensis virus. And uh, Cafeteria Rowanbergensis is this flagellated eukaryote in the upper left that lives in the ocean. And so the guy who did this, um, Shun Shao, He's got a good sense of humor, so he put his virus rolling over the ocean. And um, this one is 300 nanometers. It can, has over 15,000 proteins in it, and that's compared to polio, which is 180 proteins. It took him 3 million CPU hours to solve this structure because it's so complicated. But you can see it's amazing. It's built with some kind of symmetry, as you can see. And so when you, you can do the bigger viruses, this was done by cryo-EM, but it's a challenge and it takes a lot of computational power. Now, can we put these structures in the same nice 
categories as we did with genomes. Remember we said uh, last time that there are seven different kinds of viral genome. That's all there are on the planet as far as we can tell. You know, we have billions and billions of particles. We can put them into seven classes. Can we do the same with structures? I think so. And I think we can put them into three different classes. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. So you can remember seven and three by the subway lines. Here are the three structural groups. We have helical, we have icosahedral, and then kind of a cop out, we have complex. Because we really don't know how it's built. There are no symmetries as far as we can tell. So helical, and we'll go through each of these in some detail. Helical symmetry, you can build a virus that looks exactly as it sounds like a helix. Icosahedral, you build a protein shell, a round protein shell, and that's what these polioviruses are on the table. And then the complex viruses include pox viruses like smallpox, which is a, a very large particle, it has a DNA interior, and then a lot of proteins making up the particle in multiple membranes. And then some of these giant viruses, Pandora viruses and so forth, which are very big and have unusual membranes and nucleic acids and so forth. They don't have any symmetry as do the other two. So that's why I put them by themselves into the complex category. And, and really people are trying to figure out how they are built, but they're so big that it poses a challenge. That big cafeteria Romberganses virus is built very much like polio. It's built with icosahedral symmetry. So we can understand that. So how did we get to this point where we know about symmetry and so forth? Well, this actually started with Watson and Crick. You know, they didn't just figure out the structure of DNA. They also made an incredible contribution to our understanding of virus structure. And after, so after they solved the DNA structure, they were looking at viruses. And in the 50s, people were looking at, in the 50s and 60s, people were looking at viruses under the electron microscope using negative staining, as you can see here. So here on the left, tobacco mosaic virus, rod-like, and polio virus, spherical. And uh, they noticed that most viruses fell into one of those two categories. They were either rod-like or spherical. Now, of course, didn't have as many viruses back then as we have today. Didn't have any of the giant viruses. But this is the way things work in the early days. They noticed most particles were spherical or rod-shaped. So they came up with the idea that the way to do this would be to have one or a few proteins and repeat them over and over to make these rod-like structures or the spherical structures. And the reason they said this is because at the time, most viruses we knew about were rather small, had small genomes, and they figured, well, if there's not a lot of space in a genome to encode proteins, maybe the idea would be to have, say, one or a couple and just repeat them over and over again. So that's the idea of symmetry, repeating the protein all over. Or you have identical protein subunits. For the rod-shaped viruses, you would repeat them by helical symmetry. And for the round viruses, you would use icosahedral symmetry. And icosahedron, of course, is a platonic solid with specific properties, which we'll talk about in a moment. So they said, OK, there are these two kinds of viruses, and that's how you build them. Repetitive interactions among the same protein, helical or icosahedral symmetry. So let's explore these two symmetries for a bit and see how they work. There are two rules of symmetry for building virus particles. And they are very simple, and they tell you how these two classes of particles are built. First rule is that each subunit has identical bonding contacts with its neighbor. So this is the original Watson-Crick idea. Every subunit in either the helical or the spherical or icosahedral particle has identical bonding contact with its neighbors. And that's how you get a symmetrical arrangement, by repeating the same protein over and over again. You're going to get the same surfaces of the proteins interacting, so it gives you a symmetrical arrangement. Now, I have it in quotes because subsequently that had to be modified. There's some exceptions, as you will see in a moment. And the, no the second rule is that the contacts between the protein and these symmetrical arrangements are usually non-covalent. Uh, and again, there are some exceptions, but the vast majority of these uh, 
helical or icosahedral particles are built with non-covalent interactions. And that allows you to reverse the assembly if a mistake is made, for example, if a bad protein is introduced, there are, there are mechanisms for reversing the assembly. And of course, when these viruses infect cells, they can come apart and release the nucleic acid because there are no covalent bonds between the proteins. Now, this turns out to be not just interesting from a, for understanding the structure of viruses, but it has practical applications as well. And the implication, the observation is, if you take a structural protein of a virus, it should have all the information within it to see another copy of itself and another and another and assemble into a virus particle with very little other information. And in fact, that has been the case and we take advantage of that in the making of two different vaccines. So many capsid proteins can self-assemble, as I've just told you. We call those virus-like particles because there's no nucleic acid in them. And the hepatitis B virus and human papillomavirus vaccines are essentially VLPs uh, made by producing a single protein in either bacteria or yeast or insect cells, some other expression system. And those proteins self-assemble into virus-like particles. They form capsids just like the capsid we have here. Many viruses can do that. And it's very useful. In this case, we make vaccines out of them. We'll talk more about these later, but here we have a papillomavirus a capsid. One, we take the coding region for the major capsid protein. We insert it uh, into insect cells or yeast. We produce the capsid protein as it's made in cells. They assemble into particles and we just purify the particles. And if you get the HPV vaccine, this is what you're getting. Virus-like particles mixed together with some other chemicals. So this idea of self-assembly has practical value as well. So let's look first at helical symmetry. What is it? How does it work? Again, we have coat proteins that are in, engaging in identical equivalent interactions with one another and with the RNA or DNA genome. So here's tobacco mosaic virus. That's our electron micrograph at the lower right. Remember, first virus discovered, first virus actually crystallized as well. And it is made up of RNA, plus stranded RNA, and a single capsid protein. And that single capsid protein is the subunit there. And that subunit interacts with other subunits in identical ways to form a helix. So that's part of it, that these coat protein molecules, which is the same as the subunit, engage in equivalent interactions with one another, so they make this helix. They also interact with the viral RNA. So the viral RNA is present in this structure as a helix. So the coat proteins, they will assemble on their own, but if you add RNA, they will assemble around the RNA and form a helix made up of protein and RNA. That's, what, that's all there is to helical symmetry. That's really it. It's quite simple. And for, for tobacco mosaic virus, that's the virus particle. It's just a naked helix of protein uh, and RNA. Animal viruses are also built with helical symmetry. Here is one called Sendai virus, which is related to measles virus. Uh, and it's again, a single nucleocapsid. We call this nucleocapsid now. You'll see why in a moment. It's the orange protein. They interact equivalently with each other and with the viral RNA to form a longer nucleocapsid. It's a thousand nanometers long because the genome is much longer than that of TMV. And among all the animal viruses that have helical structures like this, they're all enveloped. Now that's not the case for tobacco mosaic virus. It's a naked helical structure. But these are all enveloped. And here's a photograph of Sendai virus the particles. You can see they're enveloped. Their shape is pleomorphic because they're not a rigid sphere. And you can see the uh, nucleocapsid inside of them. It's, this one is actually broken, and the nucleocapsid, which is just the same as the structure shown above here, is spilling out of one of them. So this is a nucleocapsid in the virus particles. It's a substructure of RNA and protein within a membrane. That makes it a nucleocapsid. Tobacco mosaic virus is a capsid 
because there's no membrane about it, around it, there's no substructure. So I think this is the best example for illustrating what a nucleocapsid really is. So here is how the animal viruses form these nucleocapsids. And another virus that has a helical symmetry is vesicular stomatitis virus. This is related to rabies virus, but people work on VSV because it's safer to work with. It's a bullet-shaped virus. I'll often draw it at the top here as a bullet. Here are electron micrographs. These are probably cryo-EMs, actually, that were used to solve the structure. And you can see it has a bullet-shaped tip, a trunk and a base that's flat, and it consists of a single nucleocapsid protein N bound to the RNA, and the N molecules interact with each other and with the viral RNA and make a spiral that goes through the whole particle, and which ends up in a, a cap at the other end of the particle, which is quite unique. So here is the structure of the nucleocapsid protein. It's shown in red and yellow at the right. And each nucleocapsid protein will bind just nine nucleotides of RNA. They're shown there in green. And here's a ring of nine or so, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten nucleocapsid proteins bound to a, an RNA. And you, know, you can extend that, and you can see you could make the entire viral nucleocapsid. So again, equivalent interactions between the nucleocapsid protein and the RNA. And again, VSV has an envelope around it. Uh, that's this uh, purple structure here. And on top, it's the brown envelope with the glycoproteins. So this is a nucleocapsid again. It's a substructure within the particle. There are quite a few uh, animal viruses with uh, helical capsids. These are the minus-stranded, single-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, I told you the paramyxoviridae. We just we looked at Sendai virus. It's a similar uh, family member. And you can see the genomes are all drawn as nucleocapsids, RNA protein complexes with helical symmetry. Rabies virus we just talked about. Influenza virus has a helical nucleocapsid. Ebola virus has a helical nucleocapsid. And again, the nucleocapsid is the nucleic acid protein assembly that's packaged within the virus particle. But there are other kinds of viruses with uh, helical symmetry as well of all sorts. Here, is a double, here are two double-stranded DNA viruses of archaea, right? the archaea bacteria and eukaryotes, the three domains of life, the archaea, interesting organism. So this one is, uh, is it's, it's a nucleocapsid. You have the double-stranded DNA bound to the protein, which is in green, and this whole thing is enveloped. So there it's a, clearly it's a nucleocapsid. But here's another archaeal virus where the DNA is bound to a coprotein and it's naked. It's very much like TMV, but this doesn't infect plants. This infects archaea. And that's a capsid because there's no membrane around it. It's not a substructure. It's not a nucleocapsid. There's some single-stranded DNA viruses of bacteria with uh, uh, this helical structure. This is a capsid. There's no envelope around it on the right. Um, negative strand RNA viruses are plant of plants. This is basically TMV, but with a negative stranded RNA, a different virus family, no envelope. And then there are what we call flexuous RNA viruses that have helical symmetry. They're flexible, whereas TMV and these rod-like viruses are rigid, always. These can be seen to be flexible. And this one, again, is a capsid protein interacting with the RNA in a helical manner, no envelope, so it's a capsid, not a nucleocapsid. So many different kinds of viruses with helical symmetry. And you can build your own if you buy some buckyballs. Here, you can buy these. You can get them on Amazon. They come from China because they don't make them here in the US. But I've got tons of them because I love building virus. I built this helical virus. And over the years, actually, many students brought me different colors. So I put them all together to this one. And this is, not, this is very simple. You just put the magnets end to end. Now, this isn't, there's no genome in here. It's just a magnet, which could be probably the capsid subunits going together. But they, they hold together very well. They're powerful magnets, so you can make a lovely capsid. If you put a membrane around it, it would be a nucleocapsid. That is helical symmetry. All right, the next question. Which of the following de describes virus symmetry and self-assembly? A, the bonding contacts of subunits are usually covalent. The bonding contacts of subunits are non-covalent. 
Each subunit has different bonding contacts with its neighbors. Self-assembly of virus particles does not occur, none of the above. So the um, correct answer, of course, is B. The bonding contacts are usually non-covalent. A is wrong, which says covalent. Usually covalent is not correct. Different, each subunit has different bonding contacts. Well, none of you picked that because that's not correct. Self-assembly does not occur. Obviously, the opposite is, is true. Uh, some of you said none of the above, but it's B, clearly. That was helical symmetry. What about round viruses? Remember, Watson and Crick said there are two kinds of viruses, rod-like and spherical. So how do you make a spherical virus, especially when viral proteins have decidedly non-spherical shapes? How would you build that? So here on the left is an electron micrograph negatively stained of polioviruses. And on the right is one of the capsid proteins of the virus. You can see it's decidedly non-structural. So how, how did they sort out how this happened? Well, there are a couple of clues. One is that all the round capsids of viruses have very precise numbers of proteins. And they're usually multiples of 60. Not always, but most of the time they're multiples of 60, like 60 or 180, not 120, uh, 60, 180, 249, 60, et cetera. And number two, the spherical viruses can be pretty small, like the 30 nanometer polio or the huge 300 nanometer cafeteria Rome Bergensis virus. But capsid proteins are all more or less the same molecular weight, about 20 to 60 kilodaltons. So as the virus gets bigger, the capsid protein is not getting bigger. So they said these have to be built with some kind of platonic solid symmetry, and it turned out it was icosahedral symmetry, because as you see, that's the best way to build a very stable structure with as little as one kind of subunit. Again, this was deduced by Watson and Crick. They said these spherical viruses have to be built in this way. So here's icosahedral symmetry. And a is a solid, of course, a platonic solid. It has 20 faces, and each face is an equilateral triangle. So here's a icosahedron, and it's got 20 of these triangular faces that are equilateral triangles, 20 of them. And uh, that gives you axes of symmetry, five-fold, three-fold, and two-fold axes of symmetry. There are 12 each of those. So here on this top image, that green one is a five-fold axis, and all that means is that there are five subunits around it, nothing fancy. Two-fold axis in blue means there are two subunits or structural units around it. Three-fold axis, there are three. And again, there are 12 of each of those kind of axes. And this kind of symmetry lets you make a closed shell with as few as 60 proteins. In fact, as you'll see, the simplest viruses have one protein repeated 60 times with this kind of symmetry, and they are a really stable shell. There are other platonic solids, as you may know, but none of them are used. Their symmetries are not used to build viruses. This is the best one, apparently, or the best way to arrange them. Now, I have to say that this virus here on the table, poliovirus, this is built with icosahedral symmetry, but this doesn't look like an icosahedron. It's spherical. And that's an important point. These viruses are not icosahedra. They are built with symmetry deduced from icosahedra, but they're actually spherical. So here are the simplest icosahedral capsids. One protein, 60 of them. The protein subunit is the same as the structural unit. Remember at the very beginning I said for some, it's the same, the, the protein is the same as the structural unit. Well, that's the case here. And here is a depiction of a simple icosahedral capsid made of 60 subunits, and I'm showing it spherical because that's the way it looks, but the proteins are arranged in a way to give you five, two, and three-fold axes of symmetry, just like icosahedral symmetry. And the proteins are shown as commas. Right? Each comma is a single protein, so you can see five of them around the five-fold axis of symmetry, two around the two-fold, and three around the three-fold. In these simplest viruses, Every protein interacts with its neighbor in an identical fashion, head-to-head -head or tail-to-tail. -tail. And that's what Watson and Crick originally had predicted. And I had identical, in quotes, 
on a few slides ago because as you'll see in a moment, it's not always the case. But this is your simplest icosahedral virus. There are lots of these out there. And just remember, the particles are spherical, not icosahedral. They have symmetry. They are built with the principles of icosahedral symmetry. But they are not little geometric shapes, if you will. So here is one virus of uh, animals that's built in this way with 60 copies of a single capsid protein. These are parvoviruses. We, we introduced these last time because they have genomes of single-stranded DNA shown on the upper right there. And we'll revisit these again. These are the viruses that can make your cats or your dogs sick, but they can also make humans sick as well. And this is a particular parvovirus called adeno-associated virus 2, AAV2. And this is a big virus for gene therapy, as we'll see later. It's very, got some very nice features that make it a great vector for delivering genes to people. It's a small particle, 25 nanometers, smaller than polio, which is 30, composed of 60 copies of a single capsid protein. Here's the single capsid protein here in a ribbon diagram on the left with different elements colored. And then on the right there is the virus particle. And again, you can see that there are five-fold axes of symmetry. That's in blue. One, two, three, four, five copies of this protein around the five-fold axis of symmetry, uh, two-fold and three-fold axes as well. So many viruses are built with this kind of assembly. The problem is when you start to get bigger viruses, which we know exist and which Watson and Crick didn't see very many of, how do you deal with that? And as I said, the proteins don't get any bigger. What you do is you make, you add more subunits to the particle. To make a bigger particle, you simply add more than 60. And the next size up would be 180, which would be poliovirus on the table there or uh, the virus shown in this picture. So now when you do this, when you add more subunits, you change the environment of the polypeptides. You now have pentamers and hexamers. So let's see if you can see that here. Here is a five-fold axis of symmetry in green, and it's got one, two, three, four, five copies of the protein subunit around it. But you can see also that in other parts of this particle, look at the red triangle, one, two, three, four, five, six subunits around it. So you have pentamers and hexamers, that's what I mean by that, uh, axes of symmetry surrounded by five or six polypeptides. And that cannot be identical. These proteins cannot all be uh, interacting identically. Because if you have five-fold and six-fold related areas, by definition, they are not uh, interacting identically. Two other um, structural biologists, Casper uh, and Klug, in the 60s, came up with the idea that as you make bigger particles, you have what they called quasi-equivalents. The bonding interactions as you build bigger particles are quasi-equivalent. They're similar, you know, they're head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail, -tail, but they're clearly chemically different because you have five-fold and six-fold interacting areas. And so that's the new term that, that came to explain how bigger and bigger virus particles were built. Now, of course, again, in the 60s, they had limited information on virus structure. And today we know that there are many viruses that don't have any quasi-equivalents even. They have totally different interactions. Even though they're symmetrical, they have totally different interactions. We won't talk much about those, but this is not where this story ended. So make a bigger particle, add more subunits. Here is the next one up from 60. It's 180. And this is, again, quasi-equivalence. When you have more than 60 subunits in a capsid, each one has a quasi-equivalent position, which means simply that the bonding properties are similar but not identical because you have hexamers uh, and pentamers. So let's look at one of these larger viruses, and here is poliovirus. Polio is sitting on the table there, but here is the precise definition of polio. It's a 30 nanometer particle, and it's made up of 60 structural units, or protomers, of three proteins, VP1, 2, and 3. So it has 180 subunits in total. And here is the icosahedral arrangement here in the middle. Uh, you have the, the three capsid proteins, VP1, 
in blue, VP2 in yellow, VP3 in red. So those are single polypeptides that form a structural unit, which is called a protomer. And so you have 60 of these structural units, which give you 180 in total. And of course, you have five-fold and three-fold and two-fold axes, but you also have a six-fold axis because you have more than 60 subunits. By definition, you're going to have a six-fold axis. And you can see that right there. And in this, this is a space-filling model I built from the coordinates using a computer program. You can color the atoms any way you like. And you can see here is a five-fold axis. There are five copies of VP1 surrounding the five-fold axis contributed by the five protomers. You can see on the left there. And here's a six-fold axis with three copies of VP2 and three copies of VP3. Clearly different bonding environments than at the five-fold axis. And on the lower left shows you exactly how these particles are built. Here is a single protomer. By the way, each of these three capsid proteins, VP1, 2, and 3, form an eight-stranded anti-parallel beta barrel, shown on the upper left here. It's also known as a jelly roll fold. It's a very common protein fold. It makes a wedge-shaped structure. And these wedges packing together make the capsid and make it very stable. So here's one protomer again of the three capsid proteins. And this is shown on the left in an intact capsid. You would put five protomers around a five-fold axis to give you essentially one pentamer, and then 12 of those would form the complete virus particle. So that's how you build the virus out of 180 subunits. We can get even bigger. Here's an interesting virus. SV40 is a polyomavirus. We will come back to polyomaviruses many times in this course because they've been paradigms for understanding transcription and DNA replication. This is a 50 nanometer particle, so it's even bigger than polio, and it's made up of 72 pentamers of VP1. So VP1 is the basic subunit or the main structural protein of this particle. And just to give you an overview, the virus consists of a capsid, a protein capsid, and in the interior, uh, is the viral DNA, which we'll come back to later. But let's look at the VP1 molecule. Here on the left, we have a pentamer made up of five copies of VP1. Different colors, one, two, three, four, five, all right? And if you could look closer at this, you will see that the C termini of each VP1 is linked into the neighboring VP1, and that's what gives the pentamer stability. In addition, the, uh, C, the N termini of neighboring, of VP1 from neighboring pentamers also insinuate into the VP1s. Here's the purple VP1 from the next pentamer. You can see the N terminus is uh, forming interactions with another VP1. So this gives the particle stability. And in the middle is how all of this is arranged. The crystal structure of this virus was solved some time ago. You can see here is VP1 pentamer five copies of VP1, they're all in purple here. And then this one is surrounded by five neighbors. And each of the neighbors, we've colored the VP1 differently. But then, of course, there are VP1s with six neighbors as well. This one has six neighbors. And so again, when you make a bigger particle, you have pentamers and hexamers, and you can see that very clearly here. Going along with building bigger particles, quasi-equivalents, Casper and Klug also came up with this idea of the triangulation number T. And I want to define it for you as the number of facets per triangular face of an icosahedron. So remember, the icosahedra are made up of 20 triangular faces, which are uh, equilateral triangles. How many subunits are in that face defines the T number. And that's illustrated very simply here. Here's a T equals one virus. So the simplest virus I showed you, the adeno-associated virus two, it's a T equals one virus, which means there is one subunit per triangular face. But you can add subunits to viruses to make them bigger. Here is a T equals four capsid because it has one, two, three, four facets per triangular face. The triangular face goes from five-fold to five-fold axis, just as it does in the T equals one. And we have put additional subunits to make more facets. Think of it as a jewel, if you will, where you can have multiple facets on a face. We've simply put four in here. This is a bigger capsid. Uh, it's now T equals four because it has four facets in its triangular face. 
And of course, because it's bigger than 60 subunits is bigger than t equals 1, it now has a six-fold axis of symmetry. One, two, three, four, five, six copies of that particular protein around the six-fold. And of course, it also has five-fold and two-fold axes as well. So the T number describes uh, the number of facets per face or the number of subunits per face. And it's a good way of knowing what makes up larger particles. And let me show you a nice depiction of that. Uh, we have a, a depiction of the structural unit here on the left and the organization at the five-fold axes in the middle and finally the capsid itself. And so um, here on the top is a T equals one, the simplest one protein repeated 60 times, one uh, subunit per face, 60 sub. So you actually you can multiply the T value times 60 to get the total number of subunits in a particle. Here's a T equals three virus like poliovirus. There are three subunits per icosahedral face. You could just compare the T equals one with the T equals three. That gives you 180 subunits. Then we're making bigger and bigger viruses. Here's a T equals four. One, two, three, four facets per triangular face, 240 subunits. Here's T equals 13, which has 780 subunits. There are 12 facets per a triangular icosahedral face. Um, and so that's the T number. It defines this, the number of subunits per face, and from that you can multiply times 60 to get the number of polypeptides. Now you can build these with buckyballs as well. You can build, in fact, I learned this on a trip to the uh, University of Indiana a year ago. It was a chemist, I visited a chemist and he had these models all over his office and he showed me how to build them. I'd never known how to build spherical icosahedral capsids from magnets. I'm very excited about this and I understand you don't share my excitement, but <laughs> I, I, I was really, and I, here is a T equals one where you just make pentamers Here's a pentamer, you do five magnets, they stick together very nicely, and you can put 12 pentamers together, 12 times five, 60 subunits. Uh, and then here's a T equals three, and you can see you need pentamers and hexamers now because you're making a bigger particle. The red are the pentamers, uh, the uh, blue are the hexamers right there is one. And I bought enough to make the next size, and I, but I haven't done it yet, but I plan to do it one of these days. Anyway, if you wanna see this and helical particles being built uh, by my hands. There's a movie here where you can check that out. Buckyball viruses. All right, our next question is, which of the following are characteristics of icosahedral symmetry in viral capsids? Produces a solid with 20 faces, each an equilateral triangle, allows formation of a closed shell with 60 identical subunits. There are five, three, and two-fold axes of symmetry. T number describes the number of facets per icosahedral face, all of the above? The answer is E, all of the above, and 85% of you got that. Each of those is a, is a definition that I gave you for icosahedral symmetry in viral capsids. Now you can make even bigger capsids. Let's talk about a couple of those. One is adenovirus, which we've seen before, this interesting, here's an electron micrograph of an adenovirus, icosahedral capsid with these interesting fibers at each five-fold axis of symmetry. These are 150 nanometer capsids. Uh, it's a T equals 25 capsid with 720 copies of a single viral protein, protein two, but it's built with many other proteins as well. It has fibers at the vertices. And this is interesting because many of the proteins have specialized roles. So far, we've only considered proteins that build the icosahedral capsid, but now you have additional proteins that don't necessarily have symmetry, but have other roles. And here we can see that in the upper right schematic where the major capsid protein, where we have 720 copies of it, that's the hexon. It exists as a trimer, and that, for example, are these orange particles. You can see one labeled right there. Those are hexons that make up most of the capsid. The, um, Fibers, we know the structure of the fiber. It has an extended shaft, a knob, and a penton base. And you can see each of those at the five-fold axis of symmetry. That's on the lower left is what the entire particle looks like. The structure has been solved of the entire particle. But then there are other proteins. There are DNA binding proteins, for example, uh, associated with the DNA. There are lots of other 
proteins both in the capsid and in the interior. And some of these we will talk about later. The fiber itself is a specialized component which you'll see attaches to cell receptors. Now an interesting principle that emerges from this is a lot of these bigger viruses have a, a protein which we call cement. And so one of them is, I probably labeled it wrong. It was one, one of these proteins in, I think it's nine, yes, protein nine is cement that helps to maintain the structure because in the areas where five and six pentamers and hen hexamers are together, that's a mismatch. So if you had all pentamers, it's really stable, but when you have pentamers and hexamers, it gets a little unstable. And as you make bigger particles, apparently you need a glue to hold it together. And that's what these uh, viruses have, protein nine, a, a cement. And here's another example of a big particle that we'll come back to as well. Real viruses, uh, 70 to 90 nanometer particles, T equals 13, but they're built of two shells. And I'm telling you this now because we'll see next week what this means for virus entry. These are viruses with double-stranded RNAs in the interior. Uh, and they're built of two shells, an external shell. They're both icosahedral symmetry uh, with T equals 13 and T equals two symmetry in those two shells. And you can see in the schematic, the outer shell is purple and the inner shell is, is brown. And those are the two structures that have been solved here in the right panel. The outer shell is made of VP7 trimers and the inner shell of VP3 monomers. And having two shells has, has functions as we'll see later. Some viruses have combinations of the symmetry that we've talked about. Here's the structure of a tailed bacteriophage which has a head that contains the viral DNA, and the head is built with icosahedral symmetry. And it has a tail, a contractile tail, that is essentially a helical structure built like the helical viruses, except it's only protein, there's no nucleic acid in it. It's attached to the head uh, via a connector at one five-fold axis of symmetry. These have base plates for attaching to the host cell membrane, so here on the right is a magnification of the base plate, very complex structures. And so it's a mixture of symmetries. Now, uh, some virus, some of these phages have an interesting spike in the base plate because they have to inject their DNA into the host cell. And to do that, they need to poke a hole in the membrane. The DNA is in the head, it's packed in at enormous pressure. When these viruses attach to receptors, uh, the tail compresses, the DNA goes through the tail, and there's a, a, a spike that pokes a hole in the bacteria so the DNA can go through it. And the spike protein looks just as you would predict for a spike. So here's this spike being uh, in this particular bacteriophage in panel A that the virus has attached to the cell surface. The tail has been compressed, and the spike, shown here in pink, is injecting into the bacterial cell wall. Here's the structure of the spike. It's a trimer of three polypeptides with lots of beta sheet. And at one end, there's a iron ion that coordinates the three proteins together, and it forms a perfect spike. I mean, look at that. If you wanted to design it yourself, you would build it looking like a knife that's poking into the membrane. So this spike is underneath the tailplate, and it pokes into the bacteria, it makes a hole, and the DNA goes through that as well. And the protein structure is exactly as you would predict it. Herpes viruses are uh, larger viruses that have some other principles that can teach us. Uh, these are made up of icosahedral capsids, made up of pentons and hexons shown in panel B, and they're enveloped. They have an envelope around them. So that is a nucleocapsid because it's a substructure. It's the protein shell with the nucleic acid within a membrane, so it's a nucleocapsid. The capsid is notable because it has a portal at one of the five-fold axes of symmetry. And in this electron micrograph, the portal has been identified by antibodies that are against one of the portal proteins. You can see the portal right there with the two dots. Here's the structure uh, of the portal itself. And in panel D, and there it is at one five-fold axis of symmetry. So there's one portal. And we think that it, we, we have good evidence that uh, DNA gets packaged into the particle through the portal, and when these enter cells, it leaves via the portal. And we'll talk about that later. Now, I have a keychain of a herpes virus that someone gave to me. And here on the left is the herpes virus. It looks very much like this structure. You can open it, 
And inside you can see the nucleocapsid and the portal is right up here. And then the nucleocapsid can be opened and you can see the viral DNA in there. So it's just perfect. Whoever made this actually did it right. They got the structure right. It looks exactly like this, the envelope, the icosahedral capsid, and the DNA within it. Really nice uh, keychain. Sometimes, as you've already seen now, you can have a membrane around an icosahedral capsid. It's a bilayer derived from the host cell because viruses do not encode lipid synthetic machinery. Uh, and these are acquired by budding, which we will look at later. Budding of the nucleocapsid through a cell membrane. It can be various different membranes in the cell, nuclear, ER, Golgi, et cetera, plasma membrane. Uh, and this is an example of budding from the plasma membrane of forming a virus particle with a membrane. We'll talk about this later. Uh, but these nucleocapsids, these protein RNA assemblies, they can be icosahedral or they can have helical symmetry. So envelope viruses can have either kind of symmetry. And when you have an envelope on a virus, you need to have glycoproteins in the envelope so that the virus can interact with cells. If you had a virus particle with just a membrane and no proteins, it wouldn't be able to attach. And so these glycoproteins typically form spikes in the electron micrograph. Here is an influenza virus. Very regular spikes on the outer membrane of the particle. These consist of very specific proteins that we'll talk about in some detail. And these are simply integral membrane proteins. Of course, cells have tons of these on their own. They have a transmembrane domain, a cytosolic domain, and an external domain. Uh, these are often glycosylated. They're often involved in assembly of the particles as well. And they have lots of other functions that we'll talk about. These glycoproteins can be perpendicular to the membrane, as in the influenza viruses I've just showed you. So here's a model of an influenza particle. There are uh, a couple of different kinds of glycoproteins in this particle, but the two main ones are red and blue. Uh, and the, the red one is the hemagglutinin. It's a trimer that's perpendicular to the membrane. We'll talk about this in quite detail next time. But some viruses, the glycoprotein is parallel to the membrane. So the flaviviruses, like Zika virus, here's the glycoprotein that mediates attachment. How this can do this while lying on the membrane, you'll see next time. The way these glycoproteins are arranged in the viruses is there are two general ways. They can be unstructured, where when you look at the particle, there doesn't seem to be any regularity, no symmetry. So the influenza virus particle here doesn't seem to be any symmetry. The glycoproteins are simply mixed randomly in the particle. We call those unstructured envelopes. Influenza virus, uh, Ebola viruses, and many others have unstructured envelopes. So the glycoproteins are, there, there's no symmetry in them that you can see. But we also have viruses with structured envelopes. And here's Zika virus, where you can clearly see a five-fold axis of symmetry. Uh, this is made up of dimers of the E glycoprotein, and they assemble in icosahedral ways by the rules of icosahedral symmetry. For some of these viruses, it's because they're interacting, the glycoproteins are interacting with a icosahedral shell below the membrane. So we call those structured because here these are glycoproteins embedded in a membrane, yet if you saw that Lying on Broadway, you'd probably say it's an icosahedral shell. Of course, you couldn't see it lying on Broadway, but it's not an icosahedral shell. It's actually a uh, virus with a membrane. Okay, that brings us to the cop-out of complex particles. But we don't know how they're built, so we put them in a category. And maybe one day people will figure out some rules. But for the most part, uh, these viruses don't make sense. Pox viruses. Big DNAs, many membranes, lots of proteins making up the particle. Uh, this is not a good approximation of what they look like. They actually look like a tiny pillow. Pithoviruses, Pithovirus sibiricum, which was recovered from permafrost. It's got a weird thick membrane. It's got a cork at one end. That's what it's called. And we think this comes out to let the DNA out. Pandora viruses, the biggest viruses, have uh, a, a weird amphora shape with a pore at one end. So there's the pitho on the right with a diagram of it below. The Pandora virus on the left. And you can see there's no symmetry. They're just, they look like big cells, but of course they're not cells. They are virus particles. 
and I hate to sort of push them into that complex category, but that's what we call them because we don't, they don't follow the rules of symmetry of the other viruses. So today we've talked about structural components of viruses that give them the symmetry that have other functions like glue, but there are many other proteins that you can find in virus particles. They may not have a structural role, but they have some other important role, and we'll encounter those in future talks, like enzymes of all sorts. Remember, some viruses have to bring an enzyme into the cell with them, and there are all kinds of enzymes you can find. You can find proteins you need to make efficient transcription work, and you can find lots of cellular components. And some of these will come back to, to understand what they're doing in the virus particle. So I don't want you to think that everything in that particle has to do with structure or a virus function. There are some cellular components in them as well. So next time, Wednesday, we'll actually do what's a logical follow-up to this. We'll talk about how these beautifully built particles attach to cells and release their genomes.